بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم ویلکم ٹو نیوز روم آئی میں ہوسٹ مخال بٹ ٹو ڈے سے ٹوینٹی ففتھ آف دسمبر ٹوینٹی ٹوینٹی تھری اینڈ آف کورس ٹو آسپیشیس اوکیشنز فرسٹلی دا برتھ ڈے دا ون ہنڈریڈ فورٹی سیونتھ برتھ ڈے آف آر that uh, is being celebrated uh, with a lot of fervor across the country and also in all across the world where Pakistanis are present and of course the second is Christmas and from our side in newsroom a Merry Christmas to all of those who are celebrating. Our first segment uh, concerns in fact this is something that uh, a lot of people are uh, currently facing and that is in uh, Palestine and that is the day 80 of uh, this conflict between Israel and Palestine. In this day 80, the number of casualties are increasing as we speak. More than 20,000 people have uh, lost their lives, have been killed by Israel. And Israel doesn't want to stop at any time. Despite the resolution that has been passed to pass to uh, send in more aid inside of Palestine, uh, there is uh, no actual uh, implementation of that in letter and spirit. Uh, people are still going hungry, people are still uh, facing a lot of disease uh, as we speak and the United Nations is extremely perturbed on that. Speaking of the United Nations, Israel has also denied uh, visas to important U UN officials saying that they are working against the interests of, uh, of Israel. Uh, anyways, this said, uh, a lot of diplomatic efforts are also happening. There is a truce, uh, talks of truce that Cairo is uh, behind uh, uh, and let's see whether that leads to uh, some kind of a development or not but as we speak there are uh, incursions by the Israeli forces not only uh, in uh, Gaza but also in the West Bank. This is going to be our highlight, our first story day 80 of this conflict between Palestine and Israel and of course uh, on Christmas Eve Pope Francis also lamented the futile war in the Holy Land Bethlehem that is going that is said to be the uh, the place where uh, Jesus Christ where uh, our also our prophet uh, was uh, born is uh, a place uh, that is now under attack by Israel. We will be starting our second story on uh, Qaeda's day today. It's the uh, 147th birthday of our Qaeda, Muhammad Ali Jinnah. The one who said, we are starting in the days where there is no discrimination, no distinction between one community and another, no discrimination between one caste or creed or another. We are starting with this fundamental principle that we are all citizens, all equal citizens of one state. This is the vision that our Qaeda, Muhammad Ali Jinnah had. This is the vision with which he... Uh, laid down the principles, the guidelines for a, peop uh, for a country, for a state, for the Muslims of the subcontinent. This is the country that is we now call Islamic Republic of Pakistan. And we owe it, uh, most of it, to the efforts of our Qaeda, Muhammad Ali Jinnah. Today is his uh, birthday. And our President Arif Alvi and caretaker Prime Minister Anwar al Hakakar have stressed upon the need of forging of unity for continuity of democracy, peaceful coexistence, and the rule of law. This is going to be our second story. Finally, we'll be talking about uh, Christmas. Uh, this uh, day, of course, uh, is also uh, extremely important for the Christian community across the world that celebrated uh, Christmas today, is celebrating Christmas according to the, of course, the timings that you have. Uh, whether you are in the US, it is Christmas Day right now in the morning, and in the United Kingdom or other parts of Europe, it's the afternoon. So people are still celebrating, observing, uh, Christmas, but a lot of people are not observing uh, Christmas with the lot with the same joy that they used to have because of what is happening in uh, Palestine. Their hearts bleed for the people in uh, Palestine. President Dr. Arif Alvi and our caretaker Prime Minister have also extended their heartfelt greetings to the Christian community on the occasion of uh, Christmas. Chief of the Army Staff, uh, General uh, Sayyid Asim Munir, has also stressed upon the need for promoting greater interfaith harmony in society in order to follow Qaeda's true vision of a united and progressive Pakistan. And he was there to, of course, attend the celebrations of Christmas in a local church. These are going to be the stories for today. Let's begin with our first, and that concerns day 80 of the uh, conflict between Palestine and Israel. We've been joined by Javed Jadun. He's a senior analyst uh, online. Javed Jadun, sir, thank you very much to have joined us. Javed Jadun Saab, uh, today is Christmas. Uh, Palestine is the place where uh, Bethlehem is present. Bethlehem is the place where uh, the, uh, the figure revered by the Christians, Jesus Christ, uh, was born. Our also prophet, uh, Hazrat Isa, was born. Uh, the fact is also that uh, there is complete disregard 
even on Christmas Day as far as the lives and the property of uh, the Palestinians is concerned. What, in your point of view, is going to be uh, the, the modus operandi of Israel in the coming days? Uh, thank you very much. First of all, uh, happy Kaiz, uh, happy Kaiz anniversary and Merry Christmas to all. And uh, as far as what is going on in Gaza is very heart wrenching. Uh, more than 100 people were killed uh, after Friday's two strikes, one in central Gaza and other in northern Gaza. Uh, most of them uh, children, women and children. It is so unfortunate that Israel doesn't discriminate. Uh, between combatants and non-combatants and uh, the only thing he does is to send his fighter planes and uh, do the carpet bombing in Gaza and as you uh, mentioned in your own intro more, uh, more than 20,000 uh, to be very precise 20,400 Palestinians have been killed so far and uh, I think more than half of them are women and children as you also mentioned uh, the Pope's message on the occasion of uh, Christmas he also talked about the uh, booming business of arms industry and what is happening in Gaza linked it with that and uh, he uh, uh, really uh, I mean he was so saddened that he said that what is happening in Gaza is not acceptable uh, and uh, I think uh, uh, pr probably the world is definitely keeping a uh, out deaf ear and blind eye they are not pay paying any attention to the sufferings of the Palestinians um, uh, the total population, which is about 2.3 million, and almost all of them have been left homeless uh, uh, due to the carpet bombings by the Israeli warplanes and tanks. And even the Israeli soldiers' deaths are mounting right now. And after Friday, about 17 Israeli soldiers have died, have been killed over there in uh, clashes with the Hamas fighters. And the total number is, uh, as, as of now, stands at about 156. And there's a probably mounting pressure on Netanyahu as well uh, because of the mounting casualties in Gaza. But as compared to what is the uh, the plight of the uh, plight of the Gazans and the Palestinians is unprecedented in in modern times. And uh, as by far, the global community has also only paid a lip service. Even most of the Muslim countries, as you mentioned, Israeli plan uh, for a ceasefire. But there has been no response uh, from the Israeli government. And most probably Netanyahu is not going to accept uh, the Egyptian uh, plan because it calls for 15 days of ceasefire and then uh, the exchange of prisoners on, uh, in, in, in different phases. But what is important right now is the complete ceasefire. Uh, let the, uh, the aid flow into Gaza and let those who are starving, even the United Nations has warned that uh, starvation is one of the major uh, apprehensions right now, apart from uh, many diseases uh, which are spreading very fast in Gaza. And even winter is taking its toll. Most of them are out in the open skies. And most of the buildings, about 80% of the buildings have been destroyed in Gaza. So there's hardly any place left for the Gazans to take shelter. And most unfortunately, wherever they take shelter, Israeli warplanes, uh, they start targeting, uh, despite the fact that they announce uh, certain safe areas for the Gazans they direct them to move to those places and then they send their warplanes and then they start bombarding them as well. I mean, the, I've never seen uh, such kind of a tragedy in my uh, journalistic career spreading over 36, 38 years. So I think it's heart-wrenching, uh, the least I can say. Yes. Javed Jadun Saab, uh, Israel's Foreign Minister Cohen instructs the ministry to reject the residence permit application and extension of two United Nations staff members saying, and I would like to quote that, the conduct of the United Nations since the 7th of October is a disgrace to the organization and the international community. We will stop working with those who cooperate with the propaganda of the terrorist organization. What kind of statement do you feel is this and other statements that have emanated from the Israeli war cabinet and from Netanyahu himself? I think Israeli war cabinet is absolutely oblivious. They are out for revenge and they want to uh, please uh, the hardcore uh, anti-Muslim, anti-Palestinian people in Israel. And uh, what they're planning to do is they want to destroy completely uh, the Gaza enclave. And they are, they, are, they are trying to push the Palestinians into Egypt or wherever they could go. And most probably, uh, they, they would like to see uh, Palestinians vanish from Gaza. And uh, the, the hawkish uh, 
a war cabinet, which is led by Netanyahu, is not paying any heed uh, to international calls. Even its, uh, its ally, America, the President Biden, unfortunately, has uh, stated several times that he is not pushing Netanyahu uh, for any, any ceasefire uh, in, in, in his conflict with the mask. I think until and unless there's a, some kind of a pressure from President Biden and uh, the United States authorities, uh, I, I, it's very unlikely that uh, we would be able to see any ceasefire. And if it doesn't happen, then the mounting casualties are definitely going to be uh, the gravest, uh, the, the gravest uh, war crimes in the modern history as well. Uh, despite the fact that uh, some of the Arab countries have definitely condemned criticized Israeli airstrikes and their offensive in Gaza, but they have done very little uh, in terms of putting diplomatic pressure on uh, Netanyahu. They could have, uh, uh, they could have gone for uh, calling back their uh, diplomats from Israel. They haven't done that. Uh, the OIC and the Arab League summits were, I think, only the showcase, showcasing uh, their diplomacy rather than putting any pressure on Netanyahu. So I think right now, uh, the kind of a brazen attacks in Netanyahu is launching against Gazans is only because he doesn't feel any pressure from any quarter uh, as far as the global community is concerned, whether the Western world, though uh, I, I, I think there have been massive demonstrations in Western capitals against uh, what is happening uh, in Gaza, and uh, the public opinion has not been able to force their respective governments uh, to put pressure on Israel uh, to stop the genocide of the, uh, uh, the Palestinian people in Gaza. Javid Saab, you talk of public opinion. Do you feel public opinion matters, whether it be in the United States where the protests are going on or in other parts of the world where these protests are also going on, or even in Israel where protests are going on against uh, the atrocities that are being committed by uh, Netanyahu and his war cabinet? Will they matter in the long run? Or is this more of a political ploy by Netanyahu to uh, continue to uh, yield power till such time that the next elections are held in 2026? Uh, Netanyahu is probably the most unpopular uh, prime minister right now because of uh, several reasons, his corruption cases and his inability to protect what Israelis see, uh, to protect the Israelis from uh, the Hamas attack. And he is the most unpopular uh, leader in, in, in modern times, despite the fact that he has formed a war cabinet over there as well. But people are, uh, I, I think there's a growing discontent as far as the resolution of the hostages issue is concerned because people are putting pressure, the, uh, particularly the relatives of the ostriches, more than uh, 100 ostriches are still uh, with uh, Hamas, and uh, about eight to uh, 9,000 Palestinians are pre imprisoned in uh, Israeli jails. The kind mm -hmm. of uh, a plight they have in Israeli jails, uh, whenever we see uh, Palestinian released from uh, Israeli jails, if you look at their faces, they're pale, uh, they are uh, starved, and they have been denied uh, medical facilities and medicines, etc. Uh, but on the contrary, uh, Hamas has, hasn't done that. And all no, just the number uh, the of most arrests that have been just the number of arrests, Javed Sab, that have been made by the Israeli forces since the seventh of October. Let's point to this specific date: is four thousand seven hundred and thirty. Just this, these uh, eighty day in these eighty days, four thousand seven hundred thirty people are incarcerated in jails. Most of them without any rhyme or reason. And of course, we all know the number of casualties that you yourself have pointed towards. But this said. Uh, you know, there are different issues that are going on. We all know that the United Nations uh, Security Council resolution was passed on Friday that was boosting, that um, called for boosting aid to Gaza. But this said, uh, that aid has not been boosted. And on the other hand, the number of raids has only increased in magnitude. Has the resolution had any impact on helping the people in Palestine? Absolutely not. Uh, they haven't cared. Uh, they never cared in the past. They don't care right now. They will never care about the uh, UN Security Council resolutions or United, UNGA resolutions because as, as far as UNGA resolutions are concerned, they're not binding. Whenever there is a re resolution introduced in the UN Security Council, it is vetoed by the Americans. So uh, the, the Israelis do know that they have a protector and they will always come forward uh, to veto any meaningful resolution in the Security Council calling for a ceasefire, uh, which could be binding on Israel. As far as UNG is concerned, it is just a symbolic resolution. And uh, they, don't, they don't find uh, it uh, binding as well. And they don't feel any pressure as far as the UNG resolutions are concerned. Even the European Union, they have failed to put pressure. Unfortunately, the German Chancellor 
instead of putting any pressure, he was more uh, loyal than the king. He said that uh, the war against Mas should go, uh, should go on, must continue. And even uh, their government tried to stop so many demonstrations as well. I, I, I agree with you that uh, as far as the public opinion is concerned, in most of the European nations, we have seen massive, massive demonstrations, but they have, been, they have not been able to uh, put any meaningful pressure on their respective governments uh, so that they could pressure, uh, put pressure on Israel uh, to stop the genocide. As far as the fighting with the mass is concerned, it would be acceptable to the global community, but without any discrimination, killing the innocent civilians and mostly women and children, I mean, these the scenes and the photographs and the footage, uh, at least I am unable to watch. I have... Uh, I haven't seen uh, something like that in my entire journalistic career. So I think even they haven't spared the Palestinians on the eve of the Christmas day as well. Uh, so what can one say? Um, how they are going to stop the genocide of the uh, Palestinians? Very hard to predict right now because there is no uh, global pressure on Israel. And Netanyahu has gone mad and mad in, uh, in, in, in taking revenge of 1,200 Palestinians. Even those figures are very... Uh, I mean, they have been doubted as well. Uh, first, they, they reported four, 1,400 Palest uh, Israelis killed, and then they scaled down the figure to 1,200. And even we have uh, seen the reports that most of them were killed by their own gunship helicopters. So a person sitting over there who is completely mad in his feelings of revenge against the Palestinians, but probably is looking beyond uh, defeating Hamas. They are trying to control complete... They are trying to take complete control of Gaza, and they would like to stay there, despite the fact that the Americans have repeatedly warned Israel uh, not to go for the occupation of Gaza. But I have my apprehensions that Israelis will uh, try, if they are able to do that, because there's a very stiff resistance uh, by the Hamas fighters. Even uh, the Israeli forces, with all the military might, their state-of-the-art equipment, their tanks, their gunship helicopters, and uh, their very modern warplanes, have not been able to subdue a few thousand Hamas fighters even in uh, in uh, uh, in southern uh, Gaza and in central Gaza and even in northern Gaza. So that is the kind of a scenario situation. And uh, you know that the, the Israeli Prime Minister recently said that they are ex the war is exacting a very heavy toll, but they have to continue until Hamas is completely annihilated. So I believe that the war. I don't see any end uh, to this genocide. Anytime I think, Javed, sahab, I think Javed, sahab, when they when you say that Netanyahu said that uh, they will continue till Hamas is completely annihilated. In fact, what he wants to say is, but till every single standing Palestinian is killed, they, uh, they, is, this is what Israel will continue to do, what it is doing since the 7th of October. And this said, you know, there's also a huge plan of instilling Israeli army uh, in Gaza once and whenever this conflict is over. I'd like to quote what the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Occupied Palestinian Territories, Francesca Albanese, has said. She says, genocide is a process, not a single act. And this process is something that we are seeing. Like you yourself have mentioned, the number of casualties, the way people are being treated, uh, people who are going hungry, there is a severe shortage of necessities, despite the resolution that has been passed by the United Nations, including clean drinking water, medical facilities. The United Nations also says nearly 2 million people in Gaza are facing severe food and water shortages, and 95% of the available water supply is unfit for human consumption. This, again, quote, I quote the Francesca Albanese who said, genocide is a process. This is a process that the Israelis themselves went through after the Second World War. Seems as if they haven't gotten over it and that is why they are perpetrating more or less the same kind of atrocities on the Palestinians. What's your take on this? I think, <clears throat> first of all, we need to differentiate between uh, the Jews and the Zionists. We have seen uh, quite a few demonstrations in the USA where Jews came out and they protested and uh, they told Netanyahu that don't kill in the name of the Jews. As far as the Zionism, Zionism is concerned, we understand that uh, they don't want to leave any space for the Palestinians, uh, <clears throat> not only Gazans, even in the West Bank we have seen the settlers unleashed the kind of uh, uh, brutalities and uh, the kind of treatment of uh, 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 of the Palestinians is unspeakable. Even the Americans had to go to the extent of uh, 
uh, imposing certain sanctions on certain individuals or groups over there. So I think this is a kind of uh, genocide which has been unleashed in Gaza. It's not only in Gaza. In the West Bank, which is also, uh, which has, the, the West Bank has also seen the kind of atrocities never witnessed I mean, just, before. Just, just, just in the last 24 hours, Javed Saab, just look at the raids that have happened in the West Bank. And I'm, I'm concentrating myself on the West Bank. Janine refugee camp, city of Janine, their Amma refugee camp, Ramallah, Akbar, yes. Jabbar refugee camp, Jericho. You know, the, the, the raids are going on. It's just not relegated to Gaza or any part of Gaza. It's also in the West Bank. So they are uh, trying to, uh, quote unquote, destroy as many of properties that belong to Palestinians as possible. They want to kill as many Palestinians as possible. They want to render their life in such a manner that becomes inhabitable and they are forced to uh, change their uh, current residence and go to another country. This is the ultimate game plan to, uh, at the end of the day, forcefully occupy what is not theirs, as they have been doing since the last decades. I think it is very important to note that they're not only destroying uh, the properties, the homes and uh, businesses of the Palestinians, they are even occupying uh, the properties of the Palestinians in uh, in the West Bank. The, I'm talking about the settlers. Settlers have been provided with the uh, modern weapons and their vigilantes are roaming around in the West Bank. They are stopping almost every Palestinian and uh, even they, uh, for the sake of fun, they're killing them as well. Uh, we have seen uh, certain footages that where uh, the Palestinian boys playing in the streets are shot by the snipers. And uh, most importantly, uh, the kind of a treatment meted out uh, to the uh, Gazans when they were arrested. Uh, they were stripped uh, uh, completely and they were made to sit in the cold. And even th there are very confirmed reports and they have been acknowledged by the Israeli authorities as well that uh, some of the... Uh, those, those arrested and uh, stripped were even killed while their families watched, uh, uh, I mean, the, the, the kind of a genocide. I mean, uh, it's unspeakable. Uh, we can't even talk about it. It is so, so uh, sickening and is so sad. It is so heart-wrenching that if you, even if we start uh, talking about the kind of uh, brutalities that is, the Israelis are perpetrating, I mean, it is beyond our imagination what is happening over there. It's very, very sad. All right, thank you so very much, uh, Javed Jadun Saab, senior analyst, to have joined us, to have talked to us uh, about this uh, conflict, about this war that is being perpetrated by Israel, Israeli forces, the Zionists, as you yourself called, on the Palestinians, and the number of casualties, of course, are increasing 20,400 dead in Gaza alone. And uh, there's another number as far as the West Bank is concerned. And not only that, there's also the atrocities that have been committed in the form of denial of uh, aid, in the form of food or water or medicine uh, to those who are in need. This is something that nobody will forget, nor will our future generations forget. This is something also that I hope uh, ends before it's way too late for the world to uh, understand, comprehend, or uh, take care of what it is truly developing into. Let's come to our second segment, ladies and gentlemen. That is the 147th birth anniversary of our Qaid Muhammad Ali Jinnah. This day is very auspicious. Why? Because it reminds us of the birth of a person, a lawyer, who uh, was not only instrumental during uh, the pre-independence days as uh, being a leader of the Muslims of the subcontinent, but also post-independence, not only for having laid the ground for the country that we uh, proudly call Islamic Republic of Pakistan, but also uh, giving uh, us the principles uh, and the guidelines on how to lead our lives. He is Qadir Azam Muhammad Ali Jinnah. He is a person who needs to be revered, and it's his birthday today. More in the following report. <laughs> Qaid's birthday is celebrated annually on December 25th, the day Muhammad Ali Jinnah was born in 1876 in Karachi, which was still part of British-controlled India at that time. After studying in Bombay and London, Jinnah became a lawyer in Bombay. In 1913, he joined the Muslim League, which had been formed to stand up for the rights of Indian Muslims, and he became its president in 1916. Jinnah believed that Muslim-Hindu unity in India was possible. But over the years, the relationship between the Hindu and Muslim communities had deteriorated to such a point 
that he reluctantly accepted that the best way to protect the rights of Indian Muslims was through partition. <laughs> In 1940, he first suggested the idea of the partition of India to create Pakistan and led the negotiations with the British government. This resulted in the partition of India and the creation of the state of Pakistan on August 14, 1947. Following the creation of Pakistan, Jinnah became the first governor-general but died of tuberculosis on September 11, 1948. Official ceremonies and events are being held throughout the country to pay tribute to Qaid's life, political struggles and significant role in the creation of Pakistan. We've been joined by two guests to talk about the life and the principles laid down by Qaid Azam Muhammad Ali Jinnah. We've been joined by Professor Dr. Riaz Ahmed. He's a former director of NIHCR, Qaid Azam University. He's a Tamgai Imtiaz. Uh, he's presently the president of Anjuman Faizul Islam, Faizabad uh, uh, in uh, Pindi. He's the author of more than 50 books. He has written 28 books on Qaid Azam Muhammad Ali Jinnah, unknown. He has more than 45 years of teaching experience and has traveled to many countries to propagate and to uh, diversify what uh, Qadi Azam uh, stood for and of course to make people know and understand the basic guidelines of Qadi Azam Muhammad Ali Jinnah. Professor Dr. Riaz Ahmed Sahib, thank you very much to have joined us. Professor Saab, uh, when you look at uh, the life of Qadi Azam Muhammad Ali Jinnah and uh, how he stood for the Muslims of the subcontinent and how he, uh, when he understood that there was no other way out but to carve out uh, a separate state for the Muslims of the subcontinent, and he uh, was adamant in his uh, in determination to work for the people, for the Muslims of the subcontinent. Today, uh, 147 years later on his birthday, when uh, Pakistan is also more than 75 years old, how do you see his contribution? How do you see the work? How do you see the principles and the guidelines that he laid down for the Muslims of the subcontinent? Thank you very much. I'm highly obliged to be to word that they have taken me on this uh, program. Uh, uh, your uh, question is very good. The Qaid uh, Azam Muhammad Ali Jinnah, the founder of Pakistan, played a marvelous role in the creation of Pakistan. If we see the whole span of his uh, political life, that is uh, uh, more than uh, 50 years. I have established that his uh, first uh, role was from 1897 to 1920, when he remained in the Congress. And in that, he also played a very important role. But when he saw that uh, Mahatma Gandhi, uh, when he came to, uh, to came dominant over the Congress politics, he is... Uh, uh, actually, uh, using the symbol in the old Brahmanic Hindu terminology, like Savarajya, Satyagrada, and he advised him not to do so, talk like a modern man. But he refused to follow Jinnah's line. Jinnah was a man of principles. He left the Congress and he wrote his life to all India Muslims. One thing I, I, I would like to point in uh, during this uh, the first phase of the Congress that he, even in the Congress platform, he fought for rights of the Muslims. So much so that when he addressed the Congress session in December 1906, he made it clear to the whole session let me remind you that Muslims of India are not inferior to the Hindus. They enjoy equal positions, equal status. That was his marvelous statement in 1906. Coming after is the second phase, and that is that is covered from 1921 to 1934. In this, when the uh, Nehru report comes in 1928, 
Like that has a, that created a turmoil in India at the time. So much so that uh, it made the uh, Hindu Congress and other their allies to come up uh, openly against the Muslims. That unified the Muslims and Kaidism tried to convince them that they did not come down. He, in March 1929, he gave his 14 point formula and he also warned that we have reached, because of the Congress policy, we have reached a point of no return. Hmm. And he, as president of the fact is, Professor Saab, that you know, so many, the, the, just the struggle or no, let's forget the guidelines and principles for, for a moment, but the fact is just the struggle or no of our Qaeda, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, for the creation of an independent homeland for the Muslims of the subcontinent is something that uh, is uh, unmatched in the last century or even more. Uh, our second guest who joins us for this very segment is Brigadier Retired Shahid Jaggi Saab. He's a senior analyst. Sir, thank you very much to have joined us. I'd like to quote uh, what our Qaid said. Uh, and I'd like to combine two quotes. The first is, with faith, discipline, and selfless devotion to duty, there is nothing worthwhile that you cannot achieve. His second quote is, there is no power on earth that can undo Pakistan. How do you see these two, two comments in the whole geopolitical context of Pakistan standing today in this day and age? Uh, thank you very much, Batsab. Uh, <clears throat> I'm honored to be uh, here with you uh, today to talk of, uh, about the Qaeda, uh, who was a man of unflinching character, uh, discipline, personality that it was just because of his personality that we Muslims of the subcontinent have an independent uh, uh, Pakistan. Uh, he was such a great person that he even refused uh, to the Viceroy to be the uh, Lieutenant General, uh, Lieutenant Governor of uh, uh, Subcontinent. Uh, his unflinching loyalty to the Muslims of the Subcontinent and his character was the one which uh, he uh, was able to fetch the dreams of uh, Muslims of the Subcontinent into a reality. Uh, as far as uh, your, uh, uh, your quotations are concerned, I would only say that Qaeda's own personality, if you read him, was a replica of uh, the first quotation which you have told. Uh, he was uh, a man who was highly disciplined and uh, who was uh, highly trustworthy uh, and he was a man who just wanted to do something for uh, the Muslims of the subcontinent that, th th uh, that th 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 their griefs of uh, 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 being in the clutches of uh, the Hindus, uh, which uh, were thinking that they, after the, the British Raj leaves, he, the, they will become the leader and uh, they will... Uh, 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 they, they will uh, uh, rule the, these uh, Muslims economically uh, and today we see that this uh, uh, this thing is coming a reality the 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 the, the, the great visionary leaders are the one that one they say their saying becomes uh, a reality in the time to come because they have the power, a God-given power to see the future. That is true. It you was, know, when, when uh, your words, uh, when your basic words, uh, Shahid Sahib, become reality, that is when you realize that this is no mere person. This is a leader and that was what our Qaid Muhammad Ali Jinnah was. Professor Dr. Riaz Ahmed, uh, I'd like to refer to uh, three words that are might not be very uh, important or 
as consequential to a lot of people. But to those who understand the Qaeda, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, these are important. For those who are Pakistanis by heart, these words are very important. That is unity, faith and discipline. Our uh, caretaker Prime Minister Warul Hakkar Sahib has also said that these principles should be the guiding ones for us all as a nation to realize the democratic state as conceived by its founder. How important are these three words, unity, faith and discipline? These, uh, the words are very important, faith, unity and discipline. You know, faith for every person in faith is very important. And that demands the commitment and looking forward and your ideology. And unity means you have to unite the ranks and file and across the country. People belong to different groups, different regions, different provinces, different sects, different religions. You have to unite them. And Jinnah's Jinnah was a, such a great leader that he never uttered any word which would annoy any section of the society. That depends on the selection of words of the great leader. And Jinnah was very careful in using the words. And Sarah Khan, in this connection, paid a tribute with reference to the Round Table Conference. He, where once he, Sarah Khan was the leader of the uh, Muslim delegation, Kai Jazm was in that. Once a meeting, Kai Jazm could not come because of his illness. Next day, uh, Ar Khan wrote to Kai Jazm, Kai, they were Muslim delegation, and they could not successfully confront the Hindus, Sikhs, and others. Your absence was deeply felt. You talked in such a manner that you would, uh, not only keep your own colleagues united, but to put uh, your opponent to such a task that they become helpless and they help us in giving arguments with you. Such the type of uh, his uniting principles were there that even Sarah Khan paid his tribute to him. Now the discipline, his whole life is discipline. Not only Western terminology, even in Islamic terminology. He learned, he learned a lot from the Holy Prophet, Ali, Omar, and others. They, their lives were very much celebrated. Then also, they, uh, in this connection, when our transfer of power of being held in a function in uh, Karachi, in the Constituent Assembly meeting, on 14th August 1947, Mountbatten, who transferred power to Jinnah and the Constituent Assembly, he said, I hope that Jinnah will keep the liberal ideas of, of democracy as put by Akbar some uh, years ago. Kaidism in rebuttal said, uh, my, my Lord, let me remind you, the foundations of democracy were laid by our Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, 14 years ago. So this is, for the Muslims, the origins of the democracy are Islam. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Dr. Riaz Ahmed Tamka Imtiaz, to have joined us and to have talked to us about the different facets of the life and the times of our Qaid Muhammad Ali Jinnah. Finally, Brigadier Retired Shahid Jagi Saab, there are two things that I'd like to understand from the personality of our Qaid, and that was A, he worked tirelessly towards interfaith harmony, towards all the faiths, all the castes and all the creeds in Pakistan, not only having their due rights, but also working together as one. Secondly, he is also one who has always uh, was always behind gender equality. He talked about women and he, I'd like to quote what he said about no about the fact that no nation, quote unquote, can rise to the height of glory unless your women are side by side with you. How important are these two facets of his personality also to be inculcated in us as Pakistanis? <clears throat> Look, Qaid Azam uh, uh, was of the opinion that Punjab, uh, Sin, uh, KPK, uh, Balochistan, and then East Pakistan should be one, treated as one. There should be no discrimination between, on the caste, creed, uh, 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 or the caste, creed, and religion basis. He made it very clear on a number of occasions uh, that. 
Uh, as far as uh, uh, the women's uh, rights are concerned, uh, the, he was the one who created at that time a uh, uh, section of the women were activated, which were uh, very much part and parcel of uh, the uh, Pakistan movement. So that's why I, uh, it is it is uh, seen that they, he was a very modern uh, 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 person. And he know that the right of the woman needs to be respected. Then you see that it is uh, he who, at the time of the elections, he uh, elections of uh, the Muslim League after the partition, uh, he refused to uh, contest the election. He said that I want to live as a legacy of a field marshal whose army is a one. So that is the thing which uh, uh, made him such a great great leader, taller than his height that today uh, we all remember him and this Pakistan is a, a, a gift to us from him. The, the sad part of the thing is that today we are uh, still uh, divided in, on the sectarian basis. We, are, we do not respect the rights of the women in our country, uh, which the political leadership of the country should get, gain a lead from the Qaedi saying and his uh, VN. And I think there is no uh, 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 power on the earth which can undo Pakistan. You that see is, that. Uh, I mean, that is again a quote. Uh, that is also another quote, Brigadier Ritar Chagi, Chagi Sahib. Failure is a one. Uh, is a word unknown to me and there is no power on earth can, that can undo Pakistan. I think if we have the zeal, the fervor, the passion that Qaidi Azam Muhammad Ali Jinnah had uh, for uh, the society, for the country that is Pakistan, I think no power can undo Pakistan, whatever happens. Thank you so very much, sir, to have joined us. I'd like to end with the one quote by our Qaid again. He said, my message to you all is that of hope, courage and confidence. Let us mobilize all our resources in a systematic and organized way and tackle the grave issues that confront us with grim determination and discipline worthy of a great nation. That is what we should endeavor to be great persons, great societies and great nations. May soul rest in eternal peace. Let's uh, end with our last story and that is of course the importance of this day for the Christian community across the world and that is Christmas. This is a day that uh, the Christians across the world celebrate with a lot of joy and fervor. That joy is diminished to a large extent because of what is happening in Palestine, in uh, Bethlehem. Nevertheless, uh, the fact is that uh, this day is extremely important for the Christian community. And there is nothing more important also when we talk of uh, today in the world uh, and what is happening in the world than that of uh, interfaith harmony. We've been joined by one of the Christian leaders uh, to talk more about the uh, importance of the day that is Christmas, not only for the Christian community, but also for all communities at large. Thank you very much, sir, to have joined us. Uh, first of all, Merry Christmas to you and all your loved ones and to you, all of your community in Pakistan and across the globe. Secondly, sir, how important is Christmas today in this year 2023? How, what should be the basic philosophy of the Christians or any other religion uh, when they celebrate Christmas? On this, you are talking to me, Father Nasser William yes, yes. is here from Abbottabad. Yes, yes, I'm talking to you, sir. Okay, okay. So, uh, on this day, this is a very blessed day, and the uh, philosophy and theology of this day is that on this day, Jesus Christ incarnated in the world 2,023 years ago. And we Christian in Pakistan and across the world go to church and worship and thanking God for sending Jesus to save us from the slavery of sin. And many Christians in Pakistan and around the world like to attend midnight mass, I mean prayer, on Christmas Eve along with regular services on Christmas Day. So we pray on this particular day for the peace in the world because Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace who came in the world to bring peace. And when he was born in 2023 years ago in Bethlehem, 
Then there was with the angel of multitude heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, on earth peace and the will, good will towards men. That is the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. So the Christians in Pakistan and across the world on Christian Christmas Day focus on the peace, which is the most important thing in today's celebrations or Christmas, whenever we celebrate. So this is the more, most uh, important thing for us and for the Christians around the world. All right. Finally, uh, sir, I'd like to understand the importance in this day and age of interfaith harmony and how important could the role of the Christian community in Pakistan and across the globe could be in times that are extremely testing uh, for the whole world. I also like to uh, refer to uh, our chief of the army staff who was at the Christchurch uh, Rawalpindi to join the Christian community in Christmas celebrations wherein he said that there was, a, uh, there was a need to promote greater interfaith harmony in society. How can we achieve that in your point of view? Well, as a Christian, on this day, importance of interfaith harmony is the message of uh, Christmas. And Christmas message uh, or is a message of universal love, brotherhood, tolerance, and sacrifice, which played a crucial role in putting society on the path of development. Therefore, we need to promote the message of Christmas to bring other people of faith together in unity in order to make them understand the importance of humanity. And when we talk about humanity uh, beyond religion, so then this, is, this message will bring us together. And there is, it is need of this message in this country, like our beloved country, Pakistan, and across the world. So this is what every year we are promoting and spreading the message of Christmas. All right. Thank you very much, sir, to have joined us, to have talked to us about the importance of Christmas and the importance of Christmas not only for the Christian community but also for the world at large and the, uh, the importance of interfaith harmony. With that, ladies and gentlemen, we come to an end of today's uh, newsroom. See you, inshallah, tomorrow with new stories segments that pertain to us, you and Pakistan. Happy Kyle's Day and Merry Christmas to all. Allah Hafiz.